Hello, everyone. My name is Mishi Chaudhry. I am not the only person standing between you and your lunch. There are two gentlemen accompanying me as well. Um, I am the legal director of Software Freedom Law Center, um, a litigator who loves litigation quite a lot, had that as my practice, and was strained by Evan to understand that it's also the notes you don't play which are important when you show restraint. And when is the time to show your legal chops? And what's good for the community is what motivates most of us. Uh, on October 16th this year, the Technical Advisory Board of the Linux Foundation issued a kernel enforcement statement to address the particular issue of trolling by one Patrick McCarty, not my words, um, and to help prevent any future issues like this from happening again. Per that statement, they adopt the termination provisions of GNU GPL v3 to apply on the kernel, although it is distributed under GPL version 2. And a short document describing the views of how the kernel community sees and feels about enforcing the license has been added to it. This appears to us as a very important event, and we think everybody should hear about it and have an opportunity to understand the details. That's why we will delay your lunch a little bit. And I welcome Mike Dolan and um, Stephen Rosted to talk about it. Please, you can have a seat sure. here, and I'll go. I will give you those mics. Let me introduce you a little bit first. Mike Dolan is the VP of Strategic Programs, responsible for collaborative projects and legal programs at the Linux Foundation. He has helped form over 50 open source and open standards projects, covering a wide range of technology segments. I'm going to cut short because these people are very accomplished and this bio goes on and on for a long time. Uh, Steven Rosted first started playing inside the Linux kernel in 1998. That's um, it's, it's 12 years after you started taking selfies with these cameras. Um, and uh, for he's been on the kernel summit program committee from 2010 to 2016. He's on the Linux Plumbers Committee, and he's one of the Linux Foundation's tec technical advisory board members, which represents the kernel community to the foundation. And I was just re-elected uh, last week for another term. term. Well, then we're going to have you forever, which is great, and we love that, like the project itself. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more, which is not my personal experience, but uh, because I've learned a lot here, uh, from SFLC's involvement in the making of GPL v3. Um, we always believed, that's Richard Stallman and Eben, that uh, even before they released the first discussion draft, that automatic termination in the style of v2 was obsolete 15 years ago. It was terribly important in the very beginning. It would not have been possible for the community to get the respect for GPLv2 in the years when it was only Eben or Richard enforcing the license um, by themselves, and there was nobody else. And if it hadn't been for this particular clause of automatic termination, which gave the opportunity to make things really bring to a closure, because they could always start that conversation, which Evan talked about earlier, that, hey, you're already infringing our copyright, and you have lost the right to distribute this program. We don't need money. We don't need publicity. We just want compliance. So at the very beginning, very important. This was the posture that built respect for GPLv2 and for the idea of copyleft all around the world. This was the automatic termination of the license which Richard Stallman and Jerry Cohen had agreed in 1991. And this was the correct way to do it in the very beginning. But in the middle of the art, they both understood when they were making V3 that it was no longer a useful structure. In fact, it created more risk and trouble. So when they set out to make V3 at SFLC with Richard and FSF, they began with an agreement that they would have a cure period approach rather than an automatic termination one. One of the difficulties from our point of view at SFLC, 
not as lawyers of the colonel and in no position to help the colonel developers make their policy was that automatic termination for the colonel for all the reasons we thought for the GNU programs was a danger rather than benefit. We welcome the decision by the kernel developers to state what we also think is correct. If you want to maximize the use of your software, automatic termination of rights is probably not the termination provision you would want to put in your license. So here we are to talk to you guys to tell us about the statement. Whoever wants to go first. Actually, I want to correct something that was stated earlier. Um, just want to make sure this is all clear. The Linux kernel license is GPL v2. Mm -hmm. The statement is about intention. The license has not changed. The clause, the GPL v3 clause, is not actually added to the license. It's an intent from the community. I don't want to make sure that's uh, clear that we didn't get something where the license has changed. Um, I guess I, might, I want me to start with the history, and when I get stuck, I'll give it to you. <laughs> um, okay, good. Um, I, when I first got elected to the Technical Advisory Board uh, two years ago, uh, I had all these plans uh, for help uh, the community to get better, to help better uh, get better communication between different aspects of the Linux community, between user space and the kernel and such. But that got all side uh, sidelined because uh, we had this huge problem that suddenly appeared. And the Linux Foundation came to us and said that, you know, we're hearing rumors about things going on in Ger Germany about a uh, single actor that is using the GPL not to help companies to be compliant and to join our community, but actually to um, self-benefit and be, you know, monetary and start suing people and stopping. And it was a concern because this is the exact opposite of why Linux kernel is under GPL. It's about getting community people joining us, uh, sharing. It's not about, you know, you're abusing the light or if you're, if you're not in compliance, we want you to make you in compliance and not sue you first. That's the whole intent. And someone was actually using the German court uh, to be able to profit from this. And if I understand correctly, in German court, you, it, everything's like hush hush. You can't even publicize that you're being sued, and so this was actually that's why it was being done in Germany because he could get away with this for so long without worrying about you know people you know finding out. But the community members would be very very upset about this, and we were. So we came up with a statement about trying to come up with intent. Uh, one of the first things that people asked about was why don't we just remove the code that he's you know just go into the kernel and just find out what, he's, what this person has done and removed all the code from it. Uh, that's possible. Uh, it's technically feasible. Uh, but the thing is, it doesn't solve the actual underlying problem. In fact, if anything, it could make it worse. It could make it legitimate. This means that we could have another Patrick McCarty come out and do the same problem. So we didn't want to go that route. We want to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And we needed to make a strong statement saying why we want you to use the kernel. And if you're not in compliance, here's how to solve this and do it in a friendly way. So we came up with first a statement. And it was first came out to be not to be a legal statement. It was just sort of a normal statement. But when we talked to lawyers, they kind of all laughed when you said, you know, it's not a legal statement. So uh, it went through several different uh, iterations. Uh, I think one of the benefits for this is that we even got, you know, the, the free software uh, consortium involved and helped us. Uh, even in fact, they, I believe they're once one of the people that helped urge the uh, GPL v3 inclusion in there. And that was strong because people were also worrying that, you know, we come up with this statement, we were worried that, okay, maybe this, since this Linux Foundation is involved, is another one of these we want to protect the corporations from being sued. And we didn't want that ad added to it as well. So we, what we wanted was a statement that come out to just basically say, you know, we want everyone to give you know, free software, be compliant, but and if you're wrong, we'll help you how to do help help you become compliant and not um, uh, just punish you for not being in compliance. So that's the history, sort of. It's did I cover almost everything? Yeah, yeah, I think that was good. Um, and and the tab, just so maybe it'd be helpful to describe oh. what the tab is. So okay, uh, the tab is a technical advisory board. Uh, we are uh, elected from the Linux uh, kernel community. 
uh, to basically advise the Linux Foundation. Uh, from my understanding, I guess from the history of it, is what the previous, what the Linux Foundation came from, what the o, uh, o, OSDL. Uh, and I think things were done, the OSDL w was kind of an organization that really didn't understand the Linux kernel community and did things that were not probably you know, agreed upon by the community. So when the Linux Foundation was formed, the Technical Advisory Board was formed as well to base, make sure that what went wrong with OSDL doesn't go wrong with Linux Foundation. So I'm on the, uh, I'm on the board, uh, this, like I said, my second, and there's only 10 of us that's elected uh, every two years. It's a two-year term. Five people are up for election every, every year. Uh, so uh, five, like I said, I was just reelected. Next year, the other half will be go up for re-election. And that happens at once a year, uh, usually the Colonel Summit. And, and there's thousands of contributors to the Colonel. And so yes. <laughs> um, uh, it, it is a very diverse, uh, widespread organization geographically as well, too. Um, I think the reason I'm up here is uh, I think there was some discussion about understanding what the legal underpinnings of what uh, was created uh, in the kernel enforcement and statement. The intent, as you heard from Steve, is pretty clear from the kernel community. Um, you know, they really did not want to even have to address this. Uh, I think there was a hope that this would just kind of go away. Um, you know, we had, you know, a number of drafts that were done. I have to give credit to Grant Likely who uh, took the initiative to write the first draft. Um, there were some challenges with the first draft as people started showing it to their lawyers and their companies or where they worked. Uh, I think it did say this is not a legal document at the first line. Um, and so, you know, there were some challenges to understand how would this statement also impact what's going on and would it fix the problem? And so we had a number of discussions about, you know, what would fix the problem. And when you look at what's going on in, in Germany with respect to what Patrick McCarty does, he's really taking advantage of the process and the system in, that's in place. Um, whether it was the Linux kernel or if it was anything else, you know, didn't really matter. Uh, if you're a copyright owner in Germany, you have a certain system and process that you can leverage. And one of the aspects is that it is very confidential in terms of who the parties are and what the actions are about. There is no docket that you can just go look up what cases does Patrick McCarty have going on in Germany. Uh, we tried. <laughs> that does not exist. It's, it's much more challenging than that. Um, it is difficult to get uh, organizations who are on the other side of the suit to also open up what they have received because of uh, you know fear of penalties or issues that might come up uh, if they disclose the documents that they're getting. Where this all tends to start, though, is not in the courts. It, it, it tends to start with a warning. And uh, in Germany, it is very common to receive a warning from a copyright owner along with a declaration or what we would probably refer to as a cease and desist. And the cease and desist in, uh, in Germany, it's very common for it to include penalties uh, for future violations. And so what you're doing is when you sign that declaration or the cease and desist, you're signing up to pay a certain penalty per violation in the future. And so it's a P times Q calculation of how many products are in violation times this price that we put into the cease and desist, and there's your penalty. And a number of organizations sign these quickly because the threat is that if you don't sign this, we will uh, file for a preliminary injunction in uh, Germany to restrain you from shipping your product. And the injunction, if you violate that, has strict penalties of like 250,000 euros or six months in jail, can actually become a criminal uh, issue. And so organizations that are shipping product in Germany don't want to face that. They're generally uh, moving at a very fast pace uh, in terms of you know the injunction can be had within two weeks in Germany. Uh, a hearing. It can also be ex parte where you're not even involved or you're not even allowed to submit your defense uh, in the discussion with, with the court. And so um, that is a significant uh, incentive for companies to settle quickly. And uh, in many cases... Can I just, add one, yeah. well, I just want to add one thing about this. Uh, Patrick McCarty was extremely smart. He would find out when they're about to release a product and then send this out just like a week before they're about to release a product knowing that this is going to cause them a huge, like the pressure for them to sign was really, really high. Yeah, so <laughs> all means available uh, to extract money is really what it was about though. There was no 
uh, real interest that we've seen in other enforcement uh, litigation towards bringing the company into compliance or fixing an issue. Some of the issues were not even ones that the kernel community would consider compliance issues, and I think that came out in Greg's blog. But the point of uh, what he was doing from a legal procedural perspective was using the system to extract money uh, from companies at their at the weakest point. And so um, doing that, you know, we had to look at what the statement was that the kernel community wanted to uh, publish. And I think we went through, you know, many iterations over a very long period of time. Uh, there's people in this room who are part of that drafting and iteration process, and thank you for your inputs. Um, and Karen uh, Copenhaver could not be here. Uh, Karen Copenhaver is our outside counsel, and she was uh, extremely involved as well in this. Uh, she couldn't be here today, but sends her regards. And through this process, though, we had to uh, develop a statement that one reflected, you know, what the kernel community wanted to say, but two also tried to put some uh, roadblocks into the path of the German procedural system that was being exploited. And so the kernel enforcement statement tries to bring in the opportunity to cure the 30-day cure provision from GPLv3. Uh, as you mentioned, we were working with, I don't know if Evan was counsel for FSF at the time or if it was just SFLC, but um, Evan was instrumental in helping us work through sort of the additional permissions and how to uh, draft that into, uh, into the statement. And by bringing in this additional permission from, I think now over 100 kernel developers have signed on to it? Um, I don't know the exact number. I think it's about yeah. 102 or something like that. But, um, you know, it's we're now, list. it's a long list. It's and on the link. You can yep. review the names. And, and we <laughs> set it up, so it's actually the license, uh, this statement is actually going to go into the Linux kernel source tree. And anyone who wants to add an act by can still actually add their name to it um, in the future. Yep. And so if you're a company, if you have developers or you know developers who are interested in, in, in standing up against this, uh, it's also important to uh, get the word out and make them aware that this exists as an option too. And um, you know, I think what, what you're doing here is you're putting a stopgap in place to help um, companies who are on the other side of this. What we did find in talking to companies who were defendants against McCarty was the reality is many of them were international companies. Uh, local counsel received a complaint it sat there for three days, it got passed along, it may have not hit the radar of somebody in the international legal group or the corporate headquarters who understood what the implications of this thing were. Um, local counsel often rushed to just um, uh, settle it by signing the cease and desist so that it didn't have to get escalated into corporate legal. Um, there was a number of things going on that um, did not you know, help the situation and uh, in some cases made it worse. And the challenge with Patrick McCarty is he does it, he gets the cease and desist, and then he just keeps coming back. And he comes back for different products. Many of them were products that he knew about when he filed the first warning letter with you. And so it keeps coming back again and again and again. And I'm aware of companies who have been, received four warning letters with cease and desist from Patrick McCarty. And, uh, the other challenge is once you sign the cease and desist, the terms of that cease and desist can be broader than what you would have been subject to under the GPL or under a breach of copyright. And so by bringing in additional terms, he now also you know, is able to put you into an even more compromised uh, negotiation position on the next round. And so um, that's where you know, the statement here that the kernel community released has a statement of intent. We intend for you know you as a user to, of the kernel to rely on the statement, and here's an additional permission that we as copyright owners are providing to you. And I also want to state that this isn't like uh, what Mike just also said. This is not just a kernel issue. This could happen to any uh, GPLv2 code. Uh, so we're actually recommending that any product that's I mean it's not you guys, but any software developers that develop anything under GPLv2 should have a similar statement, so that this can't happen. Uh, elsewhere. Yeah. I, <laughs> um, first things first with the kernel. I yes. think, you know, <laughs> let's see how this plays out and if it's effective. It, well, it, NetFilter it, has uh, a statement as well. NetFilter has a statement as well. And yeah. for those I don't know, Pat Patrick McCarty was working on NetFilter, uh, which is a, part, a subsystem of the kernel that basically it does the firewalling, which obviously is used in routers. And that's who he was going after was a lot of companies that make routers and such because they most likely use his code. So if uh, anybody has run into or runs into uh, one of these situations, uh, we also do encourage you to reach out to uh, people in the community who are, I think are pretty visible and 
knowledgeable about what's going on and how, how to get out of you know this type of situation with the best possible way um, there are a lot of uh, legal resources available that uh, you know people in the community can help and have been very willing to help um, and so uh, I do encourage you to get in touch with somebody on the legal side who does know how to defend and work against this type of uh, action because it is it is unique so so somebody gets a letter in the real world they should write to you us well uh, actually Heather um, Heather Meeker uh, has a blog it went on opensource.com in fact if you search for Patrick McCarty on Google it'll be the first uh, link that comes up um, I do I do suggest you take a look at that closely mm -hmm. as a first starting point um, but there are a number of uh, outside counsel who are experienced in dealing with this situation, Heather, uh, Mark Radcliffe, and, and Till Yeager, and others. And uh, it's really important to have somebody who understands the dynamics of how one of these procedures works to uh, help guide you or be involved if, if possible. Yeah, and you can write to us as well. Yeah, and <laughs> certainly we're all here too. The, um, Steve, um, what do you think is the message to the kernel developers? Because the statement is not uh, is also to the colleagues and other contributors who uh, contribute to the kernel because sometimes they do get upset about if they see that something is being violated to a piece of software they really care about and uh, something is being used in an inappropriate fashion so um, what are you saying to them if they are worried what should they do uh, I mean, basically saying that, are you worried that, you know, it's weakening the GPL? Is no, that no, no, I'm not worried about that. I'm just saying if a, if a kernel developer thinks that, oh, there is a problem here, what should I do now? Do they report to you? Do they oh, talk I mean, to if the they see if they see someone that's yes. uh, violating it yeah. or doing, violating this. Yeah, they, um, there's, coming to us, we would probably then go back to the Linux Foundation and mm -hmm. talk to whoever uh, might be... Uh, the person's going after too. Make sure. I think the big the problem is, as Mike mentioned, is, is the company that gets the seat, the letter first. If they sign it, then they just added a lot more trouble to themselves. So I, basically, we're just encouraging if you get anything. And I don't know about the community is usually not involved that wouldn't see this. That's yeah. the thing is we're we're too busy with our nose in the computer doing code, so we don't always worry about the legalities of it. I'm worried more about the corporations that were the, that get that letter in the mail, what do they do? And the first thing you do is to consult, you know, go to the Lynx Foundation, uh, talk to someone that's uh, familiar with uh, the whole uh, open source community and ask them about it, get some, ask for some advice or do you know anything about this? Um, I don't know if, what the laws are if you get a letter, if you're allowed to do that or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's another question which I don't know. Um, but basically publicizing this as much as possible to everyone uh, and make them well aware of it that you know, there's other, don't sign that letter and go to someone and find out what's going on and look for, look for statements from the community. So if you get a letter from this, look at the, start finding out, okay, how much has this person contributed? How much uh, code does this person actually own? And see what the actual um, uh, whole community aspect is. Do you want to take that? No. Uh, so dialogue is good. Reach yes. out to Linux Foundation. Yeah, I think, you'll, I think you'll find organizations who have been part of these actions are very uh, forthcoming outside of, you know, or maybe not some details, but, you know, at least uh, describing how to uh, deal with this type of situation. I think a lot of people are, are openly discussing it. I, I do expect this will be something that will root out in terms of an issue, uh, and it may take some time, it may take some friction, but, um, you know, I. I, I see the kernel bright days ahead, and I don't think this is going to be what what disrupts things. And also, uh, actually, uh, from the community perspective, and this isn't really the kernel community. I think the kernel community is a little bit more pragmatic. But the uh, looking at reading on Linux Weekly News when this was first posted, we had a lot of the comments were like, "Well, they're violating; they should be sued." You know, very much. Okay, they're violating. Why are you protecting the violators? And what we wanted to say was they were not. You know. They didn't mean to violate. They might have forgotten to send out a, you know, they were, you know, a notice that you could get the or how to get the code. It was a little simple thing that they did a violation of, just because not because they're being, you know, that evil company trying to hide their code. It's just because they're ignorant and how to be in compliance. And we we're trying to people they were telling tell like we don't want to hurt those people. They, you know, the people that actually want to be in compliance, we don't want to attack them because they made a mistake. And actually getting that across to the community was actually very difficult. We had a, 
explain this over and over and over again and having um, and trying to say we're not trying to protect violators we're trying to protect those that want to be in compliance but just don't know how yeah and I, I will say there was also a dose in some of these uh, situations where uh, McCarty was making claims about what compliance with the GPL required in, in, with the GPL v2 for instance over the air updates required a paper copy of the offer letter being sent along with the over the air update I'm not really sure how you do that uh, and his reaction as I understand it to the court was I don't know either but that's not my problem <laughs> um, you know other issues around you know um, how you deal with and I think Richard or David brought it up earlier sort of pragmatic compliance in terms of you know headless devices when you get into Internet of Things you know you gave the example of a light bulb but what about something even as dumb as like a light switch you know that has no ability to emit anything other than maybe you know a small little you know LED at the most and you know all of these systems are coming online you know they can use um, you know non GPL software if we make it impossible to do so or you can make it so that there's pragmatic ways to comply with the terms of the license uh, in a community agreeable context and uh, allow people to use uh, free software like the GPL v2 in those devices as well and so you know that's that's important, I think, to think about in the broader context of what are we building. I know this is very interesting and very fascinating, but I have been given so many signals from different parts of the room to wrap this up because lunch is being served. Um, Mike is here and so is Steve, so please feel free to ask your questions. But I'm going to take away is that uh, um, it's sharing, it's also bringing more and more people to the community, and uh, so it's, it's dialogue is better and talk to the Linux Foundation, talk to the community, you can write to us whenever there's such a problem, and don't rush to conclusions. So um, with that, thank you very much, and uh, we are ready for lunch. Bon appetit.